Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference every year. Head over to CanMedEvents.com now to learn all about our CanMed 2021 event. CanMed 2021 will take place September 29th through October 1st in the Pasadena Convention Center in Pasadena, California. And right now we are offering 50% off all our CanMed 2021 ticket types through April 20th. Use promo code 420SALE at checkout to receive discounted pricing on full conference, medical practicum, full conference with medical practicum, and expo only tickets. Again, that promo code is 420SALE, all one word, and the offer is good through April 20th. While you're at canmedevents.com, be sure to sign up for email alerts to stay up to date with all the news surrounding this industry leading event. The best place to do that is on our podcast page, which you can find in the main menu under the media tab. You can also go there directly by going to canmedevents.com slash coffee talk. There's a sign up form on that page. And if you complete it, you will be entered into a drawing to win two CanMed 2021 VIP dinner tickets. On that page, you can also listen to all the past CanMed coffee talk podcasts. On that note, April 1st was officially the one-year anniversary of the podcast. Thank you to everyone who has helped make this possible, from our wonderful guests, incredible sponsors, and dedicated team members. Thanks again. On this episode, we welcome Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Dr. Grinspoon is a primary care physician at Massachusetts General Hospital and an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is a contributing editor to Harvard Health Publications and the Harvard Health Blog, where he frequently writes about cannabis medicine issues. Dr. Grinspoon also writes about addiction from both the perspective of a clinician treating the disorder and as someone who is in recovery from opioid addiction. We spoke a lot about how cannabis can be used to treat addiction in our conversation, as well as why Dr. Grinspoon believes all primary care providers should be knowledgeable about medical cannabis how medical cannabis offers a safer alternative to medications used to treat chronic pain and insomnia, how years of anti-cannabis propaganda has tainted the medical cannabis conversation, why both sides of the cannabis issue need to behave better when discussing the benefits and risks, the five ways cannabis can help with the opioid crisis, how prescription drug usage tends to drop in legal cannabis states, whether cannabis itself is addictive, and more. Before we get to my conversation with Peter, I'd like to thank this episode's sponsor, Mace Media Group, who is hosting the original CBD Expo Midwest 2021, an in-person event April 9th through 10th in Indianapolis, Indiana. This event will feature exhibits from end product producers, equipment manufacturers, and ancillary businesses, including financial and legal service providers. In addition, the Expo will offer unique cannabinoid education seminars from leading cannabis and cannabinoid PhDs, physicians, scientists, researchers, and industry pioneers. The Expo is open to anyone who may be interested, from entrepreneurs and professionals to curious consumers. Join CBD Expo Tour and explore the latest and most innovative advancements in CBD. To attend this year's event or to learn more, visit cbdexpo.net. And lastly, our friends at the Hemp and Coffee Exchange are creating some great coffee. If you didn't know, hemp coffee is healthy, delicious, and a natural product rich in trace minerals and nutrients providing sustained energy without the crash of regular coffee. For more information, please check out hempcoffeeexchange.com and use the promo code DRINKHEMP to get 10% off your purchase. Okay, and without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Good afternoon, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. 
All right. I'm excited to talk with you today about how you incorporate cannabis into your primary care practice, particularly when it comes to treating addiction, because I know you have a lot of experience there. So maybe a good place to start is to have you describe the types of patients and conditions you treat, and then we can get more specifically into cannabis and addiction. Absolutely. Um, I incorporate cannabis in my primary care practice, and then I have a, a private practice that I on the side where I do consultations and certifications. Um, I think it would be great if all primary care doctors is certified and advise people on medical cannabis. That's sort of my vision for the future where, you know, all doctors are um, conversant and comfortable discussing cannabis with patients. They all know about the endocannabinoid system and they all can, can give their patients good and helpful advice. Uh, unfortunately, we're not quite there yet because of the 80 years of drug war mentality and the fact that the endocannabinoid system hasn't been really taught much at all in medical schools. Um, the irony is that medical cannabis makes my life as a primary care doctor much easier because it offers me tools that I wouldn't otherwise have. Some of the most difficult things to treat as a primary care doctor are chronic pain um, and insomnia. And the alternatives for these are often much more dangerous than cannabis. So I would say two of the most common things I treat in my primary care clinic are insomnia and chronic pain. For insomnia, I'd be using Ambien or a sedative or amyltriptyline, some kind of tricyclic. And those can affect your memory. They have side effects. They make you groggy. And you compare that with a maybe a drop or two of tincture, of cannabis tincture, and the, the person has a slight euphoria and, and gently falls to sleep and they're not groggy the next day. I mean, it's sort of a no brainer to try cannabis. Um, and it's much less habit forming, obviously, than the benzodiazepines like Valium or Clonopin. And then for chronic pain, what are your options? Nobody wants to be on opiates. Uh, Tylenol doesn't do anything. Um, and then the non-steroidals. I see so many patients with their kidneys dying in their 50s, 60s and 70s, you know, if they haven't died of a heart attack or an ulcer first, just from using chronic Aleve, Naperson, Ibuprofen, Advil, uh, cannabis is, can be a much safer and healthier alternative as Americans get bigger, portlier, and more arthritic in their knees and hips and backs. So chronic pain and insomnia are two examples of things that not only do I treat frequently in my primary care practice with cannabis, but I think that cannabis would help primary care doctors across the board if they incorporated it as a tool. It would make their lives a lot easier. Yeah, agreed. And I think we all share your vision or your goal of educating primary care physicians and helping them understand the benefits of using cannabis. Do you see that trend starting? Do you see more primary care physicians or even physicians in general opening up to the idea of using cannabis and learning more about the endocannabinoid system? Absolutely. First of all, among younger doctors, they're very, and doctors in training are sort of outraged that it's not being taught. And they are very much more educated about the war on drugs and the social history. And a lot of the younger doctors are like, I can't believe you guys aren't teaching this. The endocannabinoid system is sort of the control system for all the other neurotransmitter systems. Why would you leave this out of the medical school curriculum? But also in general, doctors are becoming so much more accepting of cannabis as the um, feedback from patients of positive clinical outcomes reaches them. You know, um, I can't say that doctors are taking the lead. With few exceptions, doctors have sort of been on the wrong side of the whole cannabis debate. But to their credit, doctors are, they're following the patients, but they're, they're starting to listen to them. And I think generally doctors are getting on board, but they, doctors generally have a, a pretty big task in terms of not only learning how to incorporate medical cannabis into their practice, but they have to sort of unlearn some of the nonsense that they've been taught about cannabis along the way. So if you think about having to unlearn stigma, unlearn nonsense, and then learn a whole new uh, treatment modality, you know, it is a pretty tall order. I mean, it's, it's doable and doctors have an obligation to do it because they've been getting it wrong uh, thus far. And it's a really uh, critical way to help patients navigate a whole host of medical issues. 
but it is, it, you know, it is going to take some time. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned was following the patients and that a lot, oftentimes patients will come to their doctors interested in cannabis. Do you find that a lot in your practice or are you suggesting it to your patients? Well, it's interesting. You know, it becomes a little bit self-selecting because once you get known as a physician that's sort of interested and advocates for cannabis, people do sort of seek you out for that. Um, and then, you know, my colleagues refer patients to me for cannabis. So on the one hand, quite a few patients come to me for that. But on the other hand, you know, just for my routine primary care patients that really don't know anything about me aside from the fact that I'm their doctor, uh, I will definitely bring it up. Uh, a perfect example of a patient that I might bring it up to is the patient with moderate chronic pain whose kidney function is starting to go after being on non-steroidals for several decades. This might be a patient that I've adopted, inherited. You know, doctors retire, they leave, you inherit a patient from someone else. Um, if it had been my patient all along, they wouldn't have been on non-steroidals all along and their kidneys wouldn't have been dying in the first place because I would have had them on medical cannabis. But if I adopt a patient whose kidneys are slowly dying because of the non-steroidals, that will be someone that I will say, hey, you can control your chronic pain with medical cannabis. Uh, we could use low doses. Uh, you probably won't have very much of the high at all if you don't want to, because we could use CBD or we could use low dosage or we could use topicals and so forth. We could experiment with different modalities, different doses, different strains. And um, we could really make a go at protecting your kidneys. And, you know, most people are open to trying this. Uh, you know, if they're elderly, if they're conservative, uh, they might have too much stigma still internalized from the 80 years of drug war propaganda. But more and more people are, are, are open to it. Uh, some people are very enthusiastic about it. And more and more people are open to trying it. And then, you know, when you try it, it it's not a success for everybody, for some people, it doesn't help their pain. For some people, they have side effects like anxiety or they just don't like how it feels. But I would say uh, for, for most people, it helps them. Absolutely. And of course, we're talking about using cannabis to treat chronic pain. And another drug that's commonly used to treat chronic pain is opioids, which kind of brings us to this whole idea of addiction. So, um, how can cannabis be used to, to treat opioid addiction? Well, there, I view it as there are five ways in which cannabis can help with the opiate crisis, four of which I support, and one of which hmm. I, I don't support yet because it's not evidence-based. Uh, cannabis can be used instead of opiates to treat chronic pain for new patients, so you have fewer patients that are on opiates that could potentially get addicted to them. You could take patients that are on opiates because we overprescribed opiates for the last 20 years. And we have a ton of people on opiates that don't need right. to be on opiates. And we could offer to transition them from opiates to cannabis and again, get them off of opiates. Now, this has to be done voluntarily. I don't believe in forcing anybody off opiates if they're on opiates. The third way is um, if you add cannabis to opiates, the dose of opiates can often uh, be 20% of what it was. You could lower the dose by 80% because cannabis and opiates work on very similar receptors. So, and a lot of the mischief you get in with opiates in terms of addiction, dependence, uh, overdose is dose related. So if you can get someone from like hundred milligrams to 20 milligrams of morphine equivalent, that's a great thing. Um, and the fourth way is that cannabis can be really helpful. And there's some studies that show this, and I can tell you this from personal experience, because I'm in recovery from opiate addiction, cannabis is probably the most effective medication for opiate withdrawal symptoms. When you're getting off opiates or transitioning onto buprenorphine, you know, suboxone, cannabis can be really helpful. So there are four ways in which cannabis is extremely helpful in getting people off their opiates for chronic pain, cutting down their dose for chronic pain, or helping them transition off street drugs. The fifth way, which I can't quite recommend yet, is can we use cannabis as a drug like buprenorphine slash suboxone or methadone as a replacement for opiates uh, in terms of medication-assisted treatment? Now, I know of thousands of patients that have vouched that they've used cannabis to get off opiates and have used cannabis as a replacement for heroin. And I truly believe that in the future, this may be the case, that you're not just going to have buprenorphine, methadone. You're going to have buprenorphine, methadone, and cannabis to get people off of opiates. However, at the moment, 
The data is that buprenorphine and methadone have been shown to reduce overdoses and death by 50 to 80 percent, and we haven't shown that yet with cannabis. So I feel uncomfortable recommending cannabis for this because it just hasn't been shown yet to reduce overdose and death. Now, say you're my patient and you have a migraine and I treat you with medical cannabis and it doesn't work. The worst case scenario is you get a migraine. We try something else. But if I treat you for opiate addiction and it doesn't worse, work, you overdose and you can die. That's a really big deal. So I think for that particular indication, you have to stick with the data uh, just because the consequences of overdosing are so dire. It desperately needs to be studied. And I think, again, in the future, we probably will be using cannabis as a medication-assisted treatment for opiate opiate use disorder. But for right now, I stick with buprenorphine and methadone. And I do prescribe buprenorphine to my patients that are addicted to opiates. We're not allowed to prescribe methadone in clinic. Uh, We are for chronic pain, but not for addiction. It's really an old fashioned law. So what is sort of the course of treatment? If, you know, I'm addicted to opioids and I come with you, I come to you sort of what's your, what's your plan of action? Well, um, we have a great team at MGH. Uh, we have a fantastic team, uh, and we do a, just an unbelievable job with opiate addiction. We have a recovery coach. We have an addiction psychiatrist. We have a, a social worker that links everybody together. We have uh, the primary care doctors. All of them prescribe Suboxone or buprenorphine. Um, if you're sick, we have a great addiction consult team in the hospital. And we have a bridge clinic that bridges people from the inpatient to the outpatient. So no one gets lost in the cracks. And every single one of our ER doctors is uh, certified to prescribe Suboxone. So no matter where you come in my hospital, you get hooked up with Suboxone and you get hooked up with a primary care doctor to follow up with you. And you get hooked up um, with a recovery coach, someone who's not going to judge you, who's in recovery, um, who's going to connect with you. If you're a complicated case, you get hooked up with a addiction psychiatrist um, who could also help with the, you know, people who are addicted also very frequently have untreated anxiety and depression. So someone who could help disentangle that or childhood trauma help you with that. So we have a very coherent and comprehensive um, addiction, uh, co- addiction team in my hospital. What I can add is I can add medical cannabis to patients, which in some studies has been shown to increase retention in buprenorphine programs, but it certainly can help with the chronic pain, the anxiety, and the insomnia as well. Uh, That's not technically an official quote unquote Mm. part of our addiction team because it's controversial. Um, Addiction uh, physicians are, there's a continuum among how accepting doctors are of cannabis and addiction uh, physicians and psychiatrists in general tend to be less accepting than doctors in general, whereas uh, oncologists, for example, tend to be extremely accepting because the oncologists see that all their patients benefit. Um, it's very complicated and a whole other discussion why addiction uh, psychiatrists are, are sort of against cannabis. Uh, you could come up with a very cynical explanation or you could come up with a less cynical explanation. But so it's um, but they tend to be uh, a little bit less supportive of it. But um, the team that I work with, the teams that I work with at MGH are very supportive of it. And we've just had a lot of success. That's great to hear. So it sounds like cannabis is sort of a, a supplemental drug in, in this, the, this whole program that you guys have put together. Fair Absolutely. To say? Yeah, it's supplemental. People are accepting of it. Um, you know, but again, I would have to say that in my hospital, you know, just like everywhere, it depends who you talk to. If you talk to certain doctors, cannabis is a helpful wellness tool. And if you talk to other doctors, it's like the devil's lettuce. We have a split just like you have everywhere else. So you're talking to me and I'm a supporter of it. Um, you, There are other doctors in my hospital that you could talk to that would completely disagree with what I just said over the last five minutes. So yeah. it's not like all doctors have this monolithic acceptance of it. There's a wide variety of, of opinions, uh, some of which is very negative. So it, we do have a long way to go towards universal acceptance. Yeah. And how do we break through there? Is it just, we need to, we need more data. We need more clinical trials. Well, we're getting there. We need more data. We need more clinical trials. We need more time. Uh, acceptance is heading in the right direction across the board with patients, with doctors, with nurses, 
with healthcare professionals across all age groups as we legalize. The sky doesn't fall um, as people get more clinical experience with it. It gets less stigmatized as people see relatives that benefit from medical cannabis and they use it and they don't become amotivational and irresponsible and they don't just sit in the sofa and eat Doritos all day. They actually go on with their lives. They actually, um, you know, their lives can actually be enhanced if they're not suffering from insomnia and chronic pain. They actually can be more active and more engaged. So I think with time, this is just getting better. But we also need people to like counter uh, the propaganda. There's still a lot of propaganda out there. Like uh, just yesterday, there was a very disappointing piece in the New York Times that was based on a very disappointing book that was sort of dressed up to look like a medical te textbook, which I've actually been reading and tweeting and making fun of for the last three weeks. <laughs> and it just calls itself an evidence-based approach. But it, and it, again, it's dressed up for doctors and it looks like a textbook, but it just cherry picks all the evidence that's against cannabis. I guess it is an evidence-based approach, but it's not really a balanced evidence-based approach if you just take all the evidence against cannabis and put it in a book and ignore all the evidence in favor of cannabis. So we really do need people to be vigilant, to look at the studies. Um, some of the studies about cannabis are really helpful and really valid, and people that are pro-cannabis need to accept the valid studies that show negative things about cannabis. Just like people who are anti-cannabis need to accept the valid studies that show things about the medical benefits of cannabis. Both sides need to behave better. But some of the studies are still these propaganda attack studies. So you need to, you know, they're just trying to show harm for no reason, you know, just as, as part of like a social statement, not as part of advancing our science base. So we just need, you know, neutral, skeptical people to look at the studies, to contextualize them. If they're helpful to say, this is helpful, all right, we shouldn't use it, I'm just making this up during pregnancy, and other people to look at the studies and say, all right, look, teen use hasn't gone up 50 times in Colorado since they legalized it. This is BS. So we need to really evaluate the literature objectively. We need to educate people, accept the harms. We need to, I think, not have self-inflicted injuries. I think there's no reason to make cannabis into gummy bears that pets and little kids are going to eat. That's just a self-inflicted mm -hmm. injury and is dangerous. If cannabis is medicine, make it look and taste like medicine. Um, I know a lot of people get got upset when I wrote a blog about this, but I really firmly believe it. So, but I think with time and with like people being responsible and with good information out there, um, this is all going to fall into place. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point to say that you know, we do need to be accepting of the harms of cannabis because they do exist. Um, and that's and that's OK, as long as we know what they are and can can act responsibly. But I think, you know, especially being in this industry, people get kind of wrapped up and, and kind of presented as this panacea and with no downsides. But that's that's not always the case. Right. And it's particularly difficult because the government spent 80 years like only funding studies about harm. And a lot of the studies were just BS, you know, give a monkey like 80,000 times, you know, the amount of cannabis. I remember exaggerating a little bit that a human would take and then the monkeys, you know, unconscious for four days and they'll be like, cannabis makes you unconscious. You know, they just do these ridiculous studies. So people don't trust the anti-cannabis literature because it's really was abused by the government and it was misused or parroted sort of unreflectively by the medical establishment. So there's a lot of distrust. And I think the medical establishment and the scientific establishment needs to regain the trust. It would be great if they acknowledged um, their role in it. I think that would really help to, to regain trust. But the problem is that none of the pro-cannabis people trust with good reason any of the anti-cannabis studies. But that leads to another problem is that some of these studies that are coming out are really good and you can't just ignore these good studies, but I understand the distrust. So we've got a complicated situation. Absolutely. And one of the things that you mentioned before is that when cannabis is legalized in these states, that the sky doesn't fall. But one of the things that does fall and that I know you've written about before is opioid prescriptions and opioid overdoses. So there definitely is something going on there with cannabis and, and opioids. Yeah, well, in Colorado, 
Medicare D prescriptions across the board fell. Wow. Not just for opiates. And I think that, you know, people were just taking a puff instead of waiting to see their doctor and getting a muscle relaxant. Instead of trying to get a prescription for Viagra, they take a puff. Instead of getting an opiate, they just take a puff. I think people were self-medicating with cannabis. Instead of trying to get an Ambien prescription from their doctor or benzodiazepine, they like take a puff off their vaporizer. I think people were self-treating. And I think that they were realizing that you cannabis does so many different things. And the endocannabinoid system is involved in so many different aspects of our body that it really does have a lot of different effects. And if you know how to use it, you can treat many things that um, these different pharmaceutical uh, agents that do one thing um, can treat, you know, which is why I think initially, at least the pharmaceutical companies donated so much money to the anti side of the cannabis referendums. And with opiate, um, with opiates, one study showed that the opiate overdoses dropped, but then another study reevaluated it later. And it's questionable whether the opiate overdoses dropped yet. I'm sure that they will be dropping because so many people are using cannabis instead of opiates, but it might be just too early to, to show that. Um, but certainly the opiate prescriptions are dropping. That's been shown in so many studies. And it follows that if the opiate people are using cannabis instead of opiates, it's hard to imagine that the opiate overdoses won't be dropping. And then finally, mm. at least three states have these exchange programs where you could exchange your opiates for cannabis. So, I mean, it's, how do you, it's hard to overdose on opiates if you're using cannabis. It's like, you know, apples and oranges. So um, I, I honestly think it's going to be extremely valuable in helping us uh, work through the opiate crisis. Of course, the opiate crisis has gotten much worse in the very short term because of uh, the COVID pandemic. So sort of all bets are off and it's going to be impossible to sort of evaluate what's contributed to what last year, this year, and probably the next year, because everything's out of right. whack. You can't really compare this year to anything and the overdoses are up. So it's going to be really hard to like sort of analyze what what happened to what and what role cannabis played. Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things that you mentioned too was it's not just opioids that people are, are substituting with cannabis. It's it's other medications as well. And and you're right, the endocannabinoid system is involved in so many different body systems. It's almost like, why not try cannabis responsibly and see if it helps? Right. And these days it's such a pain to like see your doctor <laughs> and go to the pharmacy and get a prescription and pay a copayment. And, um, you know, these drugs have side effects like Ambien, you know, people right. drive on Ambien and don't remember they were driving something like 10% of traffic accidents have Ambien in them, or they wake up yeah. and they're like, who ate all the food in the refrigerator and left all the wrappers in the table. And it turns out it was like them and they don't remember it because they were on Ambien and they were in this weird dissociative state. Like, and Ambien might even affect your dementia risk. Like, it's hard to argue the cannabis for an adult is not a thousand times safer than Ambien, for example. So not only is it more convenient in the legal state, but it's probably a lot safer. I mean, the opponents of cannabis go on and on and on about the harms and the risks. And there are harms and risks, unquestionably. But you've got to compare it to what else we'd be using. You can't just talk about the harms and the risks in a vacuum. You've got to talk about the relative harms and risks. And, you know, melatonin is good for sleep, and that seems pretty risk-free. But melatonin doesn't work that, for that many people. But then once you move beyond melatonin to the ambience, the tricyclics, which can give you arrhythmias, the benzodiazepines like Valium, which are so addictive, or Ambien, which we just talked about, it's really hard to make an argument that those are safer than cannabis. Yeah, and we've, if we've talked a lot about using cannabis for opioid addiction, but can it be used for other addictions as well? Well, I think CBD is going to have a huge role in addiction. There is preclinical research and some clinical research um, the CBD can help with cravings, Q-induced cravings. Um, they studied it in animals for cocaine addiction, for methamphetamine addiction, 
there's been some preliminary research actually for cannabis addiction. And then for there's been human studies for tobacco addiction and some for um, opiate addiction. And CBD really um, shows a lot of potential. There's a lot of studying that we still have to do, but CBD preliminarily seems like it has a lot of potential to help people with the cravings and the rumination and the urges to continue using. Um, so I think CBD is going to have a, a huge role. And then um, for cannabis in general, um, I think for withdrawal symptoms, I mean, for many drugs, when you withdraw, you have anxiety, you have insomnia, and you have this general feeling of ill ease and discomfort. And I think cannabis is going to prove to be very helpful for the withdrawal symptoms. So, you know, with opiates, uh, it co-works on some of the same receptors. So I think it's particularly helpful for opiate uh, withdrawal. But I think in general, um, you know, you're withdrawing from nicotine, you feel grumpy, you feel irritable. I, a cannabis can be very helpful for that kind of thing. So I think cannabis is going to be helpful, but I think on a kind of neurochemical level, CBD is going to target the addiction very specifically. So that's interesting. So if I'm understanding correctly, it's almost like cannabis is used more to quell the unpleasantries Simpsons. of withdrawals and less as sort of a replacement for the, um, the drug itself. Is that accurate? Right. Yes. But with opiates, it might turn out to be enough of a replacement. Hmm. We'll have to see. I mean, because so many people say that it works. It just hasn't been shown yet officially to reduce overdoses and deaths. So I don't feel comfortable like using it in that manner. Sure. Because, you and know, it, when it's something that serious, you have to go with the evidence. Absolutely. And do we understand sort of which cannabinoids or compounds within cannabis are, are really kind of doing the heavy lifting here? Is it, is it THC, CBD, a combination? Well, um, you mean for the, for the opiate yes. replacement? Um, well, I think certainly THC is a big part of it because that, um, well, we, the, the short answer is we, we don't know yet. The medium answer is that THC plays a role and CBD plays a role um, because of all the different receptors that they hit. And there's some overlap with the opiate receptors. And CBD is really complicated in how it works. And there's a bunch of theories about how it can potentially help with addiction, but they're not quite sure how it works yet because CBD affects like a ton of receptors. And I don't think they're quite sure how it affects addiction. Um, I'm not quite sure how to, um, how to explain how CBD would in particular affect addiction. I've read a bunch of articles on it, but it's very complex. Sure. Okay. And so winding down here, we talked earlier about sort of acknowledging some of the downsides of cannabis. So I wanted to ask you, um, is cannabis addiction a real thing or at least dependence? Yes, absolutely. People can get very dependent on cannabis. People can overuse it. People can have a hard time getting off it. And it can be very difficult once pers a person has been using cannabis for a long time to know whether it's help cannabis is helping them sleep or whether not using cannabis is keeping them awake. Cause they, you know, if they don't use it, they can't sleep. Mm -hmm. So it can be a fine line between cannabis is treating their insomnia or not using cannabis is causing their insomnia. It could be a very fine line. You can get physical dependence um, and you could definitely have withdrawal symptoms. Um, and you know, they could be, they're not, anything like opiate withdrawal symptoms, like you're not like feeling like you're going to die. You know, as I like to say, no one robs pharmacies. No one's like breaking into dispensaries because they're that sick from a cannabis withdrawal. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, people do, I'm not trying to stigmatize any addiction, but you know, people get so sick with opiate withdrawal, they do the like the craziest things to get drugs. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you use cannabis every day, your receptors downregulate. Uh, cause you're always bombarding them with external cannabinoids. And so they're fewer and farther between. So then if you stop using it, your natural endocannabinoids have many fewer receptors to work on. And so you have a relative endocannabinoid deficiency and you have withdrawal, you have grumpiness, 
insomnia, lack of appetite, irritability, um, probably pain sensitivity. So people do have withdrawal and uh, they do have tolerance. Obviously people, you know, use more as they go along. So people can definitely get dependent. And the way I view addiction is continued use despite negative consequences. And we all know people that should stop smoking for one reason or another and just can't. Like they have a drug test coming up for work, but they can't do it. Or I have a patient who I'm pretty sure has cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. He ends up in the emergency room every month barfing and having to stay overnight. And I'm like, can you, let's just stop smoking for three months. If you still end up in the emergency room every night, then it's cyclic vomiting syndrome. If you stop vomiting and don't end up in the emergency room, then by definition, it's cannabis hyperemesis. It goes away if you stop the cannabis. That's literally the only way to distinguish between cyclic vomiting syndrome and cannabis hyperemesis is to take the cannabis away. And my patient's having a really hard time doing that. And I would call that continued use despite negative consequences. I would call that an addiction. Yeah. I certainly would. Yeah. And you mentioned cannabis hyper, hyperemesis. Is, is that the yeah, correct pronunciation there? Emesis is barfing and hyperemesis means barfing a lot. It's just how oh, doctors wow. use Latin words. <laughs> so. Yeah. I first became aware of that condition at the last CanMed event where we actually had a, a panel about it. And um, that was, that was really fascinating. And I think it's a, it's a condition not a lot of people know about. Um, I don't know if you want to speak a, a bit more to that. Oh, sure. Well, it was underdiagnosed because when it was cannabis was illegal, no one would mention that they're using cannabis because they didn't want to have their kids taken away. Mm -hmm. Now it's overdiagnosed because it's like a trendy diagnosis that all the emergency room doctors are making anytime that people come in vomiting and cannabis is anywhere on their list or they mention cannabis using. But in reality, it's a fairly rare but real and significant condition where it's thought that cannabis um, suppresses nausea, for example, with chemotherapy patients. But if you use a lot of it over a long period of time, and this is the theory, you can overstimulate the receptor, probably the TRPV receptor. And then you have a paradoxical reaction and it causes uncontrolled vomiting. And it's really uncomfortable. It's not responsive to your traditional medications for vomiting. Ironically, it's sometimes responsible. It's responsive to like a hot shower or a hot bath um, or Haldol, that antipsychotic that is just awful, uh, can make it go away as well. But it's very hard to distinguish from something called cyclic vomiting syndrome which is just right. vomiting for no reason every once in a while. And the only way to distinguish it, again, is to take away the cannabis for like a couple months and see if the vomiting goes away. So that's actually a really good test to see if someone's dependent on cannabis, if they could stop or not. Because, you know, if your doctor who, for example, is a very pro-cannabis doctor says you have to stop for three months, there's no stigma, there's no shame. There's just, we want to see if your vomiting is because of cannabis and you can't stop, that would be an example of someone who has a, a real problem with cannabis. I would definitely agree. Um, like I said, we had a few people on the panel who had actually experienced the symptoms and described them on that panel. And um, yeah, if, if stopping cannabis couldn't prevent some of the things that were described, then I would definitely call that an addiction because it sounded pretty awful to, to go through that. Yeah, no, I've seen it twice. The person was barfing like for hours uncontrollably. Um, and like there was nothing to do. I tried Compazine. I tried Odansetron. Literally nothing worked. And for hours, like they were so miserable. All right. That's not really where I'd like to end the conversation. So, <laughs> um, well, well, you did mention that you want to talk about a few of the harms, uh, you know, to have a balanced discussion. And, you know, Every medicine I prescribe has potential harms. Like there's no medication that I prescribe as a primary care doctor that, that might not have a bad reaction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, thank you for saving that. <laughs> um, 
Before I let you go, I do want to give you the opportunity to share with the audience, um, whether it's ways to connect with you or keep up with your work, um, any websites, social media, anything like that, please plug away. Oh, sure. I'm on Twitter a lot, at Peter underscore Grinspoon, or people can um, check out my website at petergrinspoon.com. They can communicate with me or sign up for uh, you know consultations or uh, send me a message. Um, and that's about it. Between those two things, I'm pretty accessible. Absolutely. And I will put links to both of those in the show description so people can get to them nice and easily. All right, Peter, thank you again for doing this. It was a great, it was a great discussion and I hope to see you out at CAMED. Look forward to it. And uh, yeah, thanks for the great discussion. This could have gone on for hours. <laughs> thanks. All right, take care. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to our sponsor, Mace Media Group, who is hosting the original CBD Expo Midwest 2021, April 9th through 10th in Indianapolis, Indiana. Learn more at cbdexpo.net. Our next episode drops April 21st. That's one day after our 420 ticket sale expires. Don't miss this opportunity to save 50% on all CanMed ticket types. Go to canmedevents.com now and get your tickets. Also, don't forget to sign up for email alerts at canmedevents.com slash coffee talk. That will enter you into a drawing to win two tickets to our CanMed 2021 VIP dinner and keep you up to date with all things related to CanMed 2021. If social media is more your thing, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. And lastly, if you are listening on a podcast app, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that new episodes automatically download to your device. And please leave us a five-star review as well. Okay, that's it from us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be sure to come back for the next episode of CanMed Coffee Talk. Coffee Talk.